Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, Eyes to the Sky video. Today we're going to look back. I'm going to take you back to April 16th, 1998 and we're going to do a forgotten F5 event analysis. This event was uh, uh, especially fascinating to me uh, for multiple reasons but it's got such a, a good balance of science, uh, deep science, uh, damage uh, surveys, different aspects you can learn about damage and just a lot of different uh, aspects of, of uh, tornado science that can be gleaned from this particular event. And I look forward to discussing all those things with you. Let's go ahead and jump on in now. Uh, this particular tornado, of course, uh, occurred on April 16th of 1998, but between about 4 and 5 p.m. Uh, in Wayne and Lawrence counties in Tennessee. The uh, rating was F5, of course. The path length was 22.7 miles. Uh, at most, it was just over a mile wide. Uh, the storm motion was two, out of 245 degrees at 30 knots, and the tornado time was from 4.15 to 5.05 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, amazingly, it did not kill anyone and uh, produced 21 injuries, and the property damage was around $4 million. Here is the official NOAA event data uh, description from the NOAA database, the NCDC database. Uh, you can read that, it's pretty amazing. Um, and on the right we have uh, an April 16th, 98 event track map from the National Weather Service in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I believe they just produced that recently. As you can see there were a handful of F3s across northern Tennessee. Um, Nashville, downtown Nashville was struck by three tornadoes that day, um, including the F3 that went right through downtown. Uh, but by far, uh, Mother Nature saved the best or the worst for last um, along the south fringe of the upper height forcing uh, later in the afternoon and early evening as a violent tornadic supercell formed just north of Corinth, Mississippi or southwest of Pickwick Dam and moved northeast over uh, Hardin, Wayne, Lawrence, and Giles counties in Tennessee uh, and produced F5 damage in extreme eastern Wayne and across northern Lawrence County from just west of Deerfield to about six miles northeast of Summertown, Tennessee. Um, so going into and looking at some of the damage pictures now, pretty amazing damage as you can see. Um, on the far left we have a totally debarked tree, hardwood tree, a deciduous tree there. In the upper middle, a home that was completely swept off its foundation, a brick home, a sturdy brick house. And on the far right, uh, on the right we have uh, topsoil scoured from a field there in Lawrence County, Tennessee. So some amazing damage and certainly within the uh, F5 category on the Fujita scale. Uh, we're going to take a look at the upper levels here. Uh, starting for our event reanalysis. Uh, one interesting thing you can see from this is that I've got uh, 300 millibar heights, 700 millibar temperature, and 700 millibar winds plotted on this chart. This, is, uh, this map comes courtesy of the Storm Prediction Center's Violent Tornado Database and where you can go and build your own maps. And I really, really like this website. You ought to go check it out. Uh, just go to Google and type in SPC Violent Tornado Database and you should uh, get a first few Google Hits link uh, for this one and you can go and, and make your own charts and stuff. It's really cool. But looking at this map, um, honestly, you probably would not think or some may think that it would not be a violent tornadic setup. Um, you know, we have this broad positively tilted trough across the conus and um, you can see in the lower levels here uh, or at least at 700 millibars we have this relatively strong area of flow at 700 millibars um, 50 knots and areas surrounding it are 40 to 45 so not greatly enhanced but certainly greater than the um, surrounding areas and you can see coupled with that we have decent thermal advection. You can see our isotherms here are kind of kinked. There's a little cusp right there and the flow is pretty much 90 degrees across it at that little spot there near Pickwick Dam um, near the Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi uh, tri-state border there. 
Uh, and that's what I like to call an advective cusp. And what's going on there is quasi-geostrophically, if you use the quasi-geostrophic framework, you've got vertical motion um, occurring there. And as a result, thunderstorm development occurred as well because warm air advection acts as a proxy to lift uh, when warm air advection is decreasing with height. And so the height contours there really don't tell us a whole, whole lot other than there's decently fast flow moderately fast flow at 300 millibars and it's largely zonal uh, but I think it's subtle enough to where you have that nice westerly component to the upper flow uh, and given the geostrophic wind uh, component in the upper levels right the iso tax or the the winds the wind barbs are going to be parallel um, uh, to the uh, upper height contours at this level the wind barbs will be and so if you use that, you have largely westerly flow. And then in the lower levels, again, I didn't put 850 millibars on this, but at 700, we've got nice thermal advection, including this uh, advective cusp right here uh, in northern Mississippi, southern Tennessee, and northwest Alabama. So that's interesting. Another thing is, here's the base of our trough right back here over the Four Corners region of the southwest. And one of the techniques I'm working on is this doesn't always apply but this is the base of the trough if you take that due east uh, that would take you right into the area of southern Tennessee um, and so I'm still researching this and trying to understand it better but it's got a lot of potential and so if you take into consideration this particular map projection the plot if you go due east about like this um, it would take you into that area around Columbia, Tennessee, or just south of Nashville um, at this particular time at 4 p.m. on April 16th. So those are the upper levels. Let's go now to the lower levels and take a look at what we have. We have a, um, a dew point or moisture ridge right here along the Alabama-Mississippi state line up into Tennessee. And this is associated with the prefrontal trough. You can see a wind shift taking place here from north central Alabama uh, working west then across to northern, Tennessee, uh, northern Mississippi and southwest Tennessee before the cold front actually comes through later. But you can see that wind shift right in through here uh, coupled with that um, um, the, the uh, moisture axis as well. So that's interesting. Uh, so we have that prefrontal trough then associated or, or um, paired up with that upper level a higher advection at 700 millibars really helping to lift the air. Um, of course we were very unstable. I think capes that day were running 1500 to 2000 in this same region here that we've been focusing on. So that's interesting there. Uh, looking at some sounding information now. This is a modified sounding for Nashville at uh, 5 p.m. So around the time of the Lawrence County tornado it still would have been on the ground at this time in Lawrence County. But you can see that our lifted index, this is of course modified for the current surface conditions at Nashville using an 18Z uh, proximity sounding. So they use the surface conditions to modify the sounding and get this information for 22Z or 5 p.m. The lifted index was minus seven. And these values may have even been a little higher across Lawrence County, about 75, 80 miles to the southwest of Metro Nashville. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, not sure how much, but it could have been greater. Uh, and our storm relative felicity in the 0 2 kilometer layer, we're looking at 273, and the 0 through 3 kilometer layer, a 342. Um, I then used the um, a VAD wind profiler data from Nashville, the National Weather Service in Nashville's WSR 88D, and uh, ran a storm relative felicity calculation of my own and I got 365 for this 0 through 3 layer. Uh, got 140 for the 0 through 500 meter layer, which is a layer we're looking at right now to try to determine tornadic potential at UAH. Um, so that's a little below tornadic, uh, violent tornadic threshold if you consider the cool season dates as well. But if you consider the greater buoyancy in the spring, like we obviously had here, then it, it, it works out really well. So you can see the VAD wind profile. It's a supercell wind profile, isn't it? You have not overly strong veering at any particular level. You have nice steady veering through the whole profile. 
um, from the bottom all the way up to the top of the troposphere. And that's uh, indicative of a strong tornadic supercell potential giving everything else uh, favorable. Uh, here is a photograph that was derived from that VAD profile I just showed you. A um, couple of interesting things to note here. You can read these on items on the left. The storm relative wind uh, vectors veer nicely with height. You can see starting off here at the surface uh, or storm relative inflow vector and then working your way up through the troposphere. You have that nice veering or clockwise turning uh, with height of your storm relative wind vectors. Uh, that helps to produce vorticity in the atmosphere. Uh, number two, uh, it's obviously a very pronounced hodograph kink here at one kilometer. You go from a hodograph that is mainly favoring speed shear to one that is favoring directional shear. Um, and obviously some speed shear still as well, but one that is favoring speed shear um, in the lower levels and then directional shear above one kilometer. So you get that nice pronounced hodograph kink that Dennis Miller talked about in his um, conference preprint back in 2004. Uh, where he examined hotographs. Uh, but also uh, Thompson and Edwards from the Storm Prediction Center actually first identified that hotograph kink back in 2000. Uh, Rich Thompson and Roger Edwards from Storm Prediction Center. Uh, number three, the critical angle, which is the difference uh, between the surface uh, storm relative wind vector and the 500 meter bulk shear vector uh, is 68 degrees in this case, which is within the range of what is commonly associated with violent tornado events in the Deep South. Uh, that ranges quite a bit, but you can go and read uh, Esther Held and Giuliano to learn more about uh, the critical angle. But they're the ones that, that formulated that there. That'd be a good paper. That was written in 2008. Um, four, the uh, six and nine kilometer storm relative wind vectors are longer uh, than the surface storm relative wind flow. So if you look here in these upper levels, here's the nine kilometer, here's the six, and you compare the length of these vectors to the surface storm relative inflow uh, vector, they're definitely longer. And I'm still looking into this. This is something that I have never seen in the literature personally, but it's something I'm very interested in. Um, and uh, the last two here, the six and nine kilometer deep shear surface and upper storm relative wind vectors are nearly parallel. Uh, so you have these deep shear vectors, uh, which are uh, your stipled lines, your dashed lines here, uh, this being the six kilometer and this being the nine kilometer bulk shear vector. You see how they're largely parallel to their respective storm relative wind vectors at their heights, respective heights. So there's six. Um, see how they're nearly parallel, the stipled line and the um, zigzag line here, and this pair as well. And that I have found tends to, and it makes sense if you think, uh, tends to produce very long track supercell storms, or supercell storms where the precipitation um, volume and configuration is distributed such that it allows for a long track violently rotating updraft within a supercell. So that's important. We're still looking into that, but promotes long track storms. Um, everything else considered favorable, of course. And then lastly, um, if you consider a square box that is bound by the surface storm relative inflow vector, um, your straight leg of your hodograph until it, the kink occurs, all the way over and then back down this uh, two meter or 2000 meter, excuse me, uh, storm relative wind vector, you get this box shape. And I've been noticing that right moving supercells tend to occur, be associated with hodographs that have that box structure. And that's something I think that needs some more uh, scientific investigation. But I think it's worth it. <clears throat> and uh, also, obviously, this hard dog leg to the right or this hodograph kink would also tend to uh, lend to the idea, lend credence to the idea that uh, right moving supercells could occur if your storm relative wind flow vector is adequate um, and geometrically sound like which is here. So that box structure where you can most easily fit a box that takes up most of this area, that's something to consider down the road. Uh, here's some radar data. Really good loop here on the left. Unfortunately, the closest uh, radar to the forgotten F5 was the high top uh, next rad, which sits up in high top Alabama in Jackson County. And I believe the, the closest uh, distance was 68 nautical miles 
um, at any one point in the in the tornado's path. So that's not overly close. So you're going to be hitting the the most of the mesocyclone up at about 15 to 20 thousand feet at that range, if not even a little higher at 0.5 degree tilt. Uh, so I used it and did the best I could to get you a good loop. I think this one's pretty good. Uh, Nashville and Columbus, Mississippi also have uh, Nexrad loops available from this day, but I chose High Top because of its location. Uh, in the upper right, you can see um, a full scope shot from High Top uh, of the Forgotten F5 Supercell. Pretty, <clears throat> pretty evident where it is up here, uh, just to the northwest of Huntsville, between Huntsville and Nashville, west of Interstate 65, but it really stands out, doesn't it? And then this is a close-up view of this shot here. So an incredible supercell, no doubt. Very long track tornadic supercell. Uh, produced some incredible damage that day. So to sum everything up, uh, the spring of 1998 was very active across the Deep South and Tennessee Valley. Uh, another F5 tornado had occurred just eight days prior uh, near Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, the devastating tornadoes occurred in other nearby states as well during this springtime period of 98. <clears throat> uh, the event was highly interesting from a dynamical standpoint in that the atmospheric wind flow is not especially strong, uh, but the specific combination of wind shear and instability was highly ideal for powerful tornadoes that day. Sometimes it's more about the mix and the distribution of parameters, uh, the specific combination, than any one parameter being overly strong. Of course, you can have days too when the, all parameters are incredibly strong and they still be well balanced and you get something like April 27th, 2011. Um, so also the atmospheric conditions strongly favored right moving supercell storms as we previously discussed with the hodograph. Uh, these conditions consisted of moderate speed and light but steady veering or clockwise turning with wind, um, wind with height uh, throughout the troposphere. More research is to come surrounding this. I look forward to, to doing that and being able to share with you some of the additional research that I get from that. Uh, hodographs are an extremely powerful to, tool to better understand specific details concerning tornadic potential. Uh, it is crucial that forecasters and researchers use these frequently uh, during the days of uh, potential severe storms. And uh, lastly, down here uh, we have this paper on the right. Uh, check this out for more information on the Forgotten F5. It's a wonderful resource. It was written by John Gordon, Bobby Boyd, Mark Rose, and Jason Wright um, from the National Weather Service in Old Hickory, Tennessee. Actually, I don't think any of those forecasters still work at that office, but um, very excellent paper by some great meteorologists there. So uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this, and uh, we'll do some more videos coming up soon on specific events such as this. But this is the Forgotten F5 and what it did. So I hope you all have enjoyed it. Have a great day.